John Podhorst joins me. It's because of John that I have now heard every single day for the last month, the 12 chairs. Why do you start the most listenable podcast in America with the 12 chairs every day, John? It's the theme of the song. So the 12 chairs is a movie made in 1970, um, a, an unsuccessful Mel Brooks movie. The only one he made adapted for material, not his own, a Russian novel, comic Russian novel written in the 1920s about a con artist. And, uh, but it, he wrote a song for it. The theme theme song, which is called hope for the best, expect the worst. Some drink champagne, some die of thirst. You could be Tolstoy or Fanny Hurst, and uh, it seemed the perfect theme for a podcast uh, from a Jewish magazine uh, where the general historical theme, as you may know now, is uh, is that uh, don't worry, no matter how bad things are, they're probably only going to get worse. So that, worse. that was that was how we announced ourselves. I want everyone to subscribe to the commentary podcast and to the magazine. It's imp It's been a crucial part of the life of the center right in America since I began reading it in 1978. And it marks the evolution of American intellectual life greatly. John is its editor. John, I want to do three things. First of all, I'll help you raise some money because you're very bad at this. I did PBS fundraisers forever, right? For 10 years, I was with PBS. And I did it with Lou Grant, Ed Asner. And we used to ask for money repeatedly and we gave the number out and we begged throughout the show. You talked about Jerry Lewis and the, and the uh, MD fundraiser and then the Chabad fundraiser got mixed up in there. You guys are the worst at asking for money. You've just got to do it relentlessly, John. You know, this just proves that cultural stereotypes are false, Hugh. Right? It's, Who's supposed that's to be true. better raising money? Jewish people. You're a nice, you know, you're a nice Christian man. You should be far more forbearing and not, and so I do what I can. I do what I can. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed. But yes, commentary is a nonprofit, five oh one C three. It's the end of the year. This is the time for giving. Uh anyone who listens, reads, uh, finds profit in our viewpoint. Very easy, commentary.org slash donate, um, and uh, and we very much appreciate anybody's support. Now, I just now, put up I the link because of something that... something you said last week. Never ha This might be the moment for which commentary was founded. And I would like right. you to explain that a little bit because it resonated with me. I said, you know, that's right. This might be the moment for when commentary was founded. Commentary was founded in November 1945 at the after after the conclusion of World War II, and its mission was a sociological one. Uh, started by the American Jewish Committee, then the most prominent uh, brotherhood organization among Jews in the United States, and the idea was that it was going to be the great, the best expression of Jewish American thought that could be produced by a publication with the purpose of explaining America to Jewish people and explaining Jewish people to America. That's a very lofty task for a very small base, small circulation magazine, highbrow, monthly. But that was its intent. And then, you know, three years later, the state of Israel came into being. And though there was, there was a great deal of controversy uh, among American Jewry about whether or not Israel was a good or a bad idea, once there was a Jewish state, the community fell in line with the notion that there were hundreds of thousands and then millions of Jews, uh, you know, in peril in the Middle East who needed to be supported and defended and argued for. And so we have existed now for 78 years with uh, these multiple missions, uh, defending Israel, uh, serving as a bulwark against anti-Semitism and as the politics of the United States began to shift, defending the West, defending the West's institutions, defending the United States from the intellectual left that had lost faith, confidence, and trust in it, uh, and making the argument for this as the greatest as a country on, on God's green earth. So when October 7th happens, but that's a very broad mission, right? And very, um, you know, it's important. All of it is important. Uh, when October 7th happened, Israel came on into existential threat in some ways for the first time since the 1948 question of whether or not 
what we see here is the opening salvo in a war from Israel uh, staged by Iran through its proxies, for example. Um, the idea that, and that we saw this uh, in the wake of this uh, completely unprecedented and unanticipated and unprovoked massacre of the equivalent of 23,000 Americans in a single morning, that um, uh, the Jewish community, both uh, in Israel and as it turned out in the United States and across the world, may never have been in as much threat in the existence of the magazine. So what you could say is, in some historical providential sense, that commentary has built up cultural capital over the last um, eight decades for the purpose of being here authoritative, understood to be authoritative and important to make the arguments that need to be made against this onslaught, uh, particularly in the United States and this growing uh, rise of anti-Semitism. Just yesterday, uh, a synagogue that I uh, used to attend sporadically in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown, Kesher, an Orthodox synagogue, a man shows up outside the door, starts saying, sh shrieking, gas the Jews, and starts spraying at the doorway a foul-smelling liquid uh, into the air. He is finally apprehended by the police, but um, this is what is going on now almost routinely in the United States, not only on college campuses, but in cities, and we'll see increasingly whether or not this happens at um, accessible synagogues and things like that. In my lifetime, I'm 62 years old, I've never seen anything remotely like this. Somebody pointed out that uh, between the lynching of Leo Frank in Atlanta in 1915 um, and the slaughter of 11 Jews at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018, in the United States, the most philo-Semitic country that has ever existed, um, there had never been like a Jew killed for being a Jew. I mean, there there were a couple of there was a there was a case on the Brooklyn Bridge in 1991, and there were other little. But basically, Jews were not targeted for being Jews specifically in the United States for almost for more than a century, and now on a daily basis, Jews are being targeted in petty ways, not just murderous ways. Yeah, Flooded John, I. Yeah. I just had Raviv, uh, Haviv Reddit Gur on, Reddit. and I pointed out to him that Neil Ferguson released to the free press last week an argument that American universities are now where German universities were in the 20s. Right. And I asked him, did he think it was possible in the United States that the United States would go the way of Germany? Because Germany was where uh, European Jews were most assimilated and also became where they became the victims of the greatest atrocity in recorded in human history. And the GoPro program, program, you know, where they had, the terrorists had the GoPro cameras sl strapped on their head, the GoPro program ought to have turned everyone in favor of American Jewry. It's had the opposite right. effect of drawing out all the poison. And I'm kind of right. stunned. I, 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 and I well, think so Jews are I. actually afraid. So am I. Jews are afraid. Jews are afraid in this way for the first time in their lives. Jews have been afraid like everybody else in America, like they were an urban population. Uh, you know, 40% of them, 50% of them lived within 10 miles of New York City uh, in the 1970s, and they were very afraid of crime and crime in their neighborhoods. And some of it was black on white crime or black on Jewish crime, and they were very afraid. But I don't think people were afraid of attack because they were Jews and where Neil Ferguson makes an important analogy though i don't think that i think it's a, it's important uh as a warning shot but i i don't think it can really happen here in the same way is that is that the reason to note the similarity between german universities and american universities is that people are under the delusion that these populist explosions that often lead to anti-semitism are all by the unwashed, you know, they're by the proletariat, they're by, you know, what Hillary Clinton called the deplorables. And in fact, this is a, a, a an elite-led attack on the Jewish people that is going on here. It is this uh, intersectionality, the idea that Jews are white colonial oppressors and therefore that the Israelis who got killed deserved what they got and that, and that Hamas is in the right and Israel 
is in the wrong. These are not ideas that, you know, a, a Trump voter who is at Darlington Speedway cheering on, you know, stock car racing, that's not their idea. This is an idea bred at, on college campuses by Kimberly Crenshaw, the inventor of the idea of intersectionality, by by uh, by people like that. And, and it's been sort of 30, 35 years in the making. Ideas have been gestating uh, in the academy. Uh, and, you know, enough people have been trained in them over the course of 35 years to be there kind of as shock troops when the trouble started. And you take social media, which makes it very easy to organize people, right? Just to say, come to Columbus Circle or come to, you know, come to the Grove or the Farmer's Market in L.A. or to the Magnificent Mile in Chicago at 9 p.m. because we're going to have a big, uh, big dust up. Um, you can get a thousand people there in an hour if you need to. And maybe that's not that many people out of 330 million in the United States, but it sure makes a lot of noise. And then they break a lot of windows and they steal a lot of stuff and they start screaming slogans. Some of them are metaphorically uh, Israel genocidal, like from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. And then some of them are like the guy who drove past the Israeli embassy saying, you are all oppressors and we will kill you all. I mean, and it is routine now on X to see videos of women walking into random restaurants to take down Israeli flags and then getting into verbal altercations with people. It's, it's actually kind of astonishing to me what's happened. That is John, my neighborhood. I, I, that video that you mentioned. You is mentioned it? Is a, a restaurant called the Hummus Kitchen. It's on 74th and Amsterdam. And you can see it. It came, went up last night. Someone walks into a restaurant where there's an Israeli flag hanging in the window and pulls it down. John, stand by for a second. Okay. If I can, I'll give you one more second because I think a realignment is happening in America. Joined by John Podhortz right now. John, I want you to opine a little bit. The thing that has been most surprising to me in the last 10 weeks that Israel has been at war is the relative sanguinity. Uh, uh, you guys are very, very relaxed about the Democratic Party when I listen to you. You all think that Biden and the relay race, it's Lloyd Austin this week, it was Jake Sullivan last week, it was Tony Bleakin. They go over and they hector the Israeli war cabinet and then they come back. And I think I hear you saying that, don't worry about it, they're, they're strong, they're doing this for their base. I think the Democratic Party is fracturing and I am not at all assured that they're going to stand by Israel. Why are you sanguine about this? Oh, I'm not sanguine about that at all. I'm simply uh, trying to analyze the situation day by day. And day by day, I think that the that Biden himself, I'm not sure about everybody else, that Biden himself has withstood pressures that I did not believe he had it within him to withstand, to flip. Uh, on this matter, say to Israel, sue for peace, you know your part in this, you know how you feel. Remember, he is only president because he was Barack Obama's vice president. Imagine Barack Obama after 10-7, and you know that the United States' position on these matters would have been wildly, radically different. There would have been lip service paid to the idea that Israel had the right to defend itself. But maybe they shouldn't do it this way. Maybe we could call a meeting in, in uh, you know, I don't know, Vienna, where we could have everybody come sit down at the table. And remember, we don't want to get Iran too worked up because we're desperately trying to bring Iran back into the community of nations. Biden is the leader of a party that has uh, largely turned on Israel, and he is refusing to follow it down that road, as opposed to situations like the Inflation Reduction Act or other acts uh, that he has taken as president that seem to violate or contradict things that he ran on. Um, so I'm struck by this. I take it as being almost providential that, uh, and um, I keep uh, making reference to the um, story in the Bible um, that is known as a Balaam's ass, which I know you yes. as a literate person know. <laughs> so Balaam is a, is a prophet, actually a magician, 
and he is sent out by an anti-Semitic king to go and curse the Jews at a time when the Bible accepts that his curse of the Jews would actually be supernaturally effective. And so he sets out on his donkey to go curse the Jews. And as he's riding on the donkey, the donkey turns and starts talking to him and saying, why are you doing this? What's the matter with you? And he says, why are you talking? You're a donkey. And the donkey says, I am the voice of the Lord. Do not do what you think you are about to do. And Balaam beats the donkey and he arrives at the promontory where he is supposed to attack the Jews and he opens his mouth and God possesses him and he praises the Jews instead of attacking them. And um, uh, that story has some resonance for me with Biden because I would have expected him to give up the ghost long before now on this matter. What's most important here is I don't think it matters in the terms of this conflict. That is to say, Israel is going to do what Israel has to do there is 90% support or something like that in Israel for the mission of destroying Hamas utterly. And uh, Israel is a democratic country represented by democratic politicians, and they will do what they have to do for their voters uh, and will not be pushed around so easily by the United States. That said, I'm deeply concerned about the Democratic Party. I'm deeply concerned about these numbers about youth in the Democratic Party and how they feel about this. And, uh, and I have been for a decade or more, you know as well as I, that there was this moment in 2012 at the Democratic uh, Presidential Convention in Philadelphia when the mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villagorosa, was simply getting the crowd to a- affirm an assent to the Democratic Party platform, which said that Jerusalem should be the capital of Israel. And from the floor of the convention, there was a revolt against this provision. And uh, people started screaming and yelling. And then uh, Villagorosa said, okay, we'll we'll do this by voice vote. You know, who who says yay and who says nay? And the and the nays were overwhelmingly louder than the yays. And then Villagorosa said, the measure is passed, meaning I'm not listening to you. Because I had forgotten that. That might have been the I think the whole party there now. If, yeah. if if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and Lloyd Austin are the dam, I'm expecting the Johnstown flood. John Podhoritz of Commentary, thank you for joining me. Everyone should listen to the podcast. It is amazing. It's got five or six people every single day, Monday through Friday. And go to commentary.com. Look for the donate button. Help Commentary. them. Org. John, ask Commentary. repeatedly. Org. And tell, yeah. <laughs> Year end. Org. Completely tax deductible. Commentary.org, 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 and donate. Thank you, John Podhoritz. Follow him on exit, J Podhoritz, and go to commentary.org and donate. We need their voice. We need it now more than ever.